I'm Kelsey. This is my channel, The Fancy Hat Lady Reads. I am wearing one of my fancy booktube hats, and today I am bringing you a double review video. Now, the theme that connects these two books very obviously, so that I felt I had to pair them together in a double review, is fairy tales and poetry. But more than that, I feel like these two books come from a similar literary tradition. They feel sort of spiritually related to one another, so much so that the author of one book actually wrote the introduction for the other. The first is Finding Baba Yaga, a short novel in verse by Jane Yolen. This was an ARC copy that I got at Book Expo last year, and this was published in October of 2018. And the second is Snow White Learns Witchcraft, which is a collection of stories and poems by Theodora Goss with a focus on fairy tale themes. I actually had a digital copy of this for review via NetGalley. It was released in February of 2019. Um, when I finished it, it was my first five-star read of the year that wasn't a reread, and so I immediately ordered this print copy that you see here um, because I knew I wanted to have a copy on my shelves. And yes, Jane Yolen does provide the introduction to this book. So I'm going to start with Finding Baba Yaga, which I gave a four-star rating on Goodreads. This short contemporary fairy tale book from beloved classic author Jane Yolen is a departure for the Tor.com publishing line that published it in a couple of key ways. First, as the subtitle indicates, it's told in verse. More specifically, it's comprised of a collection of short poems, some of which directly further the narrative, while others serve more introspective or even playful purposes. Second, it's being presented as young adult, even though Tor.com is generally an adult SFF imprint. Now, I don't know how successful this marketing technique has been for them, but I do admire the effort to support forms of YA storytelling that are outside the mainstream of current trends. Of course, this book is about finding Baba Yaga, the classic witch from Russian fairy tales and folklore. But first, Yolen establishes the protagonist Natasha's fraught home life in a contemporary household with an abusive father. As with everything in this book, we don't really get the full story, only snippets, and we can fill in the rest on our own. But Natasha is a vulnerable young person who has absolutely no one she can go to for help. So she runs away with no idea of what she's running toward or what she'll do when she gets there. And this is when the elements of fairy tale intervene, because Natasha is the exact type of girl who, with no other options and nowhere else to go, might stumble across Baba Yaga's chicken-legged cottage in the woods. The type whom Baba Yaga might actually offer some aid to, though her kindness is tough and never straightforward. This version of Baba Yaga is a modern old lady, but with all of the frightening power and quirks of the mythic figure. The juxtaposition of the fantastical and the mundane isn't fussed over in this world of poetry, it just happens. And it happens again when another girl, Vasilisa shows up at Baba Yaga's house as if straight out of a fairy tale, princely suitor on her heels and all. But while these two girls develop a camaraderie and closeness, they do ultimately have two very different destinies and roles to fulfill. A major theme of Finding Baba Yaga is language itself. At home, Natasha's father polices her language, washing her mouth out with soap when she uses a bad word. And throughout the poems, Natasha longingly comments upon others' use of language and that richness that she's been denied. Baba Yaga ends up giving her both the freedom to revel in crude language and the tools to tell a story through poetry, which may be comprised of lies in service of a greater truth. By the end, you may wonder if these are Natasha's poems, then how much of the story is actually real? The prince and his castle? Learning to fly in a mortar and pestle? The witch herself? Yolan's message and Natasha's is that it doesn't really matter. What matters is that Natasha has found, through trials and tribulations, a place to belong and perhaps even a calling. Now, hearkening back to the idea that this is YA, 
I would call this a unique approach in YA storytelling, except that when pressed to think of it, I've actually read another book that's pretty similar in some ways. Psyche in a Dress by Francesca Leah Bloch is similarly short and told in poetry, juxtaposing Greek mythology onto a gritty contemporary story in a way that makes you question how much is literally meant to be real. I think that Yolen's book, like Bloch's, will probably work better for some teen readers than others, depending in part on pre-existing knowledge of the underlying folklore, as well as a willingness to commit to a less straightforward form of narrative. But really, any fan of fairy tale fiction, regardless of age, may find something worthwhile in this particular coming-of-age story. So that is the end of my review of Finding Baba Yaga. I'm going to now move on to Snow White Learns Witchcraft. This collection of fairy tale inspired stories and poems is wonderfully structured. I know that's an odd way to start a review, but it's one of the elements that was most striking to me about the experience of reading this book. The stories and poems included here are ordered so that most pieces feel like they flow from the previous, either turning around to give a startlingly different approach to the same fairy tale, or picking up on a symbol, story element, or theme and telling a different story with that element. So you'll get several pieces about bears in a row, or roses, or snow, though they'll be vastly different from one another. Or two Rumpelstiltskins, or two Sleeping Beauties, again very different. And it feels like it comes full circle, ending with the same fairy tale, Snow White, with which it begins. There are a number of themes in Theodora Goss's writing that recur throughout the collection. These are fairy tales of self-determination, of storytelling, of introspection. Many of the poems, like, for example, Thumbelina or The Sensitive Woman, feel like they must be very personal, leading to a sense that you've been allowed inside the author's private world. But you can see the same authorial voice in even the strangest fantasies, and it all feels very of a piece. In case it isn't abundantly clear already, I loved everything about this book. I don't think that the feeling of Goss's writing itself differs significantly between the stories and the poems, so the style feels very cohesive. That said, the poems are more likely than the stories to feel like snapshots, extrapolations from one idea in a fairy tale, or explorations of a character's perspective, while the stories do have fully developed narratives. I think that with the poems, it's probably helpful to come to them with a strong fairy tale background, since they don't necessarily stand alone from the source material as well as the stories do. Loosely, about half of the total pieces in this book are original to this collection. That said, the five longest stories that serve as the centerpieces of the book are, with only one exception, reprints. Two of them I'd actually read before, and I am pleased to report that they are just as good on a second reading. So to go through those five longest stories in order, The Rose in Twelve Petals is a Sleeping Beauty retelling, with an unusual, melancholy, and ambiguous ending. It's told in twelve parts, following different characters, with the theme of roses recurring throughout. It's also alternate history, but in a low-key way that doesn't upstage the fairy tale. Blanche Fleur borrows some of the appealing imagery from the white cat, for example, the castle of cultured felines and the title character, as well as a bit of its three-part quest structure without feeling like it's actually a retelling. A miller's son with fairy ancestry is known as the village idiot until he's apprenticed to his aunt, the Lady of the Forest, who sends him to spend a year each under three very different teachers, accompanied by his cousin, the talking white cat, Blanche Fleur. I enjoyed it tremendously. Red as Blood and White as Bone was the first reread for me. You can read it for free online at Tor.com, so I'm going to link it down below. And it's an original fairy tale as far as I can tell, though I will admit that I won't always recognize 
um, a retelling's source material. Set in a fictional European country as World War II looms, it's about a serving girl who takes in a woman whom she believes to be a princess in disguise and helps her to attend a royal ball. This one is ultimately about stories and the passion to learn and preserve them, but it gets bloody and disillusioned along the way. The Other Thea was the second reread for me. It first appeared in the anthology The Starlit Wood. It's a contemporary story based on Hans Christian Andersen's The Shadow, and it's about an alum of a school for witches who returns to campus for help during a gap year. Since her grandmother's death, she's felt apathetic and depressed, and she's told that she will continue to fade away unless she can retrieve the shadow that her grandmother cut away from her as a child, a journey that takes her into the Fey other country. Along the way, she has to learn to think for herself and use her skills as a witch, skills that manifest in the form of poetry. Miss Lavender's is a magic school that I'd have loved to attend. The other country is both mysterious and modern, and there's another talking cat, so what's not to like? And finally, A Country Called Winter is the only lengthy story that's original to this collection. It's another contemporary set one, a Snow Queen retelling, where the elements of the story and the roles of the characters are all jumbled up a bit. The theme of academia continues here, and it's also about the experience of growing up as an immigrant in America separated from cultural roots. We also see Goss's ability to blend ethereal magic into a real-world setting, with a nation that is both supposedly a real country with politics and diplomacy, and also, at the same time, the actual magical source of winter in the world. This may have been my least favorite of the longer stories in the collection, but it still had plenty that made me happy, including a lost princess reveal, and an ethereal, mythical, female Santa Claus figure. I can't talk about all of the poems here, or even most, since there are so many, but I'll mention that my favorites, at least this time through, included Thorns and Briars, about keeping one's heart in a box, Goldilocks and the Bear, a more straightforward narrative retelling about the lifelong bond between a young thief and the bear cub who helped her escape his family's home when they were both children, and The Nightingale and the Rose, a gorgeous take on Oscar Wilde's fairy tale of the same title. But I can imagine that different poems would stick out to me if I were to reread this book at a different time in my life, just as the stories that were rereads for me this time around struck me slightly differently than they did the first time. It's very hard for a story collection to rank a full five stars from many reviewers, myself included, because inevitably some pieces will seem stronger than others or appeal more to the individual reader. The miracle of this collection for me is that there wasn't a single dud. Every story and every poem feels like it has something precious to offer, be it intellectually, emotionally, or both. And Goss is a writer in whose hands I feel safe. Not because she doesn't take the reader to dark places, she does, but because she leads you through them and out the other side richer for the experience. So that's it. That was my double review of these two books. Let me know if you've read either of these and what you think. Let me know if you're planning on reading them. Anyhow, I hope you're having a nice day. That is all. Bye for now.